Good evening, everyone. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian at Georgetown, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Ellen Catherine Gestalter Memorial Lecture. This program was established in memory of Ellen Gestalter, a 1998 graduate of Georgetown College, by her family to honor Ellen's concern for social justice issues in the United States. As many graduates of Georgetown do, Ellen joined Teach for America upon graduation and was assigned to a DC public school in Anacostia. Ellen remained at the school after her two-year commitment and planned to teach one or two more years, then go to graduate school, and with a 23-year-old's zeal, reform either the entire educational system or the nutritional system available to poor children, both of which appalled her. Sadly, Ellen became ill in the fall of her third teaching year and was unable to continue. However, she obtained a professional chef certificate and was accepted into a New York University master's degree program in public health education before she passed away in 2004. The Gestalter family's generosity has enabled us to continue Ellen's legacy by hosting thought-provoking speakers whose ideas and work provide insight and focus on significant social and economic issues in America, Ellen's passion. I'd like to take a moment to thank Ellen's parents, Herb and Bobby Gestalter, who are here this evening for their dedication to the library and for continuing Ellen's passion through endowing this lecture. Ellen and Bobby. In honor of Ellen's commitment to social justice, our speaker this evening is Dr. Susan Martin. For those of you who knew my predecessor, it's the other Susan Martin at Georgetown. <laughs> Dr. Susan Martin, an expert on issues of immigration in both the academic and policy worlds. Dr. Martin holds the Donald G. Hertzberg Chair in International Migration at Georgetown and serves as the director of the Institute for the Study of International Migration within the School of Foreign Service. Before coming to Georgetown, Dr. Martin served as the Executive Director of the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform, established by legislation to advise Congress and the President on U.S. immigration and refugee policy. Prior to that, she was the Director of Research and Programs at the Washington-based Refugee Policy Group. She has also served as an Assistant Professor in the American Studies Department at Brandeis University and is a lecturer in the History of American Civilization Department at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Martin has published several books, the most recent of which is A Nation of Immigrants. She earned her BA from Douglas College, Rutgers University, and her MA and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. We're very pleased to have her here this evening to discuss the topic of great importance in our quickly evolving world. As many of you saw on the invitation to this lecture, Ellen Gestalter herself came from a family of immigrants, as many of us do. Ellen's grandfather and great-grandmother fled Nazi-controlled Austria in 1939. The gifts and challenges of immigration are alive and well at Georgetown. As a Catholic and Jesuit university, Georgetown welcomes and sustains rich diversity among our students, faculty, and staff. 22% of our undergraduate students come from a minority ethnic background, and over 2,000 of our students, faculty, and scholars are from more than 130 different countries. Community in diversity is a core value at Georgetown and is central to the identity of our university and, of course, our library. The Ellen Catherine Gestalter Memorial Lecture is part of our yearly series of lectures for the Library Associates, a group of Georgetown alumni, parents, and friends dedicated to helping the library in its attempts to help conserve culture for posterity and transform learning and research. The associates provide vital support for our mission, and this support allows us to host wonderful programs such as this one tonight. As we participate in the capital campaign for generations to come, support from the library associates and your involvement to us is more important than ever. If you're interested in joining the library associates and you're not now a member, I hope you will see me after this or speak with Miriam Nickerson, who is in the back of the room, our Director of Development. Before I ask Dr. Martin to speak, I also want to take a quick moment to thank those whose efforts made tonight's program possible. First and foremost, to Jenny Smith and Jessica Pierce and Alyssa Skyrick of the library staff 
for the program arrangements. Thank you also to David Hagen for making the invitation and photographing the event this evening and presenting us with a wonderful poster, and to Ed Keller who is doing the filming. And lastly, thank you to the campus bookstore representatives for making the book sale and book signing that will be following this program. And I'd also like to recognize and thank members of the Georgetown University Library Board who were with us this evening. Our board is a very dedicated group working on behalf of this library. They spearhead the support that's so essential to us and that allow us to continue programs like this, as well as to provide excellent services and resources to the Georgetown community. We're very grateful to all of them, and I'm going to ask them to stand so we can appreciate their efforts. Library Board Fund. Thank you all for being here. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Susan Barton. Thank you very much, and I, I apologize for the fact that I have to sit um, during this, as you can see from the crutch, I, I have some what, limited mobility right now. Um, but I'm really honored to have been asked to uh, deliver the lecture this, this evening. Um, and I, Ellen um, was graduating just about the time that I came to Georgetown, so I didn't have the uh, opportunity to have, have her in one of my classes. Um, but the commitment to social justice uh, that she represented and that certainly this lecture represents um, is so fundamental to the identity of Georgetown as a university uh, that having the opportunity to extend remarks um, with regard to one of the, I think today, one of the most important issues um, in social justice um, is a fantastic opportunity for me. Um, I really appreciate Urban um, Bobby's um, endowment of this lecture and the ability to be able to speak on these issues. Uh, we are, by every measure, a nation of immigrants. Um, but that term, nation of immigrants, actually hides as much as it illuminates. Um, because we also have a very rocky history of um, with regard to immigration. Um, it's not been all love and kisses towards the newcomers that um, have entered the country. Um, and we have had very periods of great generosity towards immigrants and periods, frankly, of um, very negative, very harmful policies. Um, in the book that um, I wrote, um, and uh, we'll have copies available. Um, I argue that there are actually three models of immigration um, into the United States that began during the colonial period and continue into the present. And it's the vying of those three models that often determine what type of response we'll have to both immigration, but more importantly, to the immigrants themselves. Um, that one can have a very positive policy with regard to admission of immigrants, um, but have a very negative policy towards the rights and the opportunities that are afforded to the immigrants. Uh, the first model um, that I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I dubbed the Virginia model after the first colony uh, that was established here and sustained, and it was largely a labor migration model. Uh, newcomers were welcome. Um, but they were welcome for their labor and not necessarily as members of society or members of the full community. Um, it's a model that can be highly exploitive. Um, with the Virginia Colony was founded by what John Smith, uh, Captain Smith, referred to as adventurers. Um, but the adventurers generally tended not to be workers. Um, very few people wanted to come to Virginia at the beginning, um, given the death rates of those who did come, it was not surprising. Uh, so the colony initially used indentured labor. Uh, they gave opportunities to people who uh, were living in poverty, but they had to pay off their uh, debt over a very extended time. Not enough people came, though, so the colony started a second model, um, and that was the importation of convict labor. Um, not quite as benign, uh, perhaps, as the indentured labor, 
um, people were given a choice between being hung or going to Virginia. <laughs> Quite a good choice. Um, and they had about a 50% chance of dying coming to Virginia, 100% if they stayed in England, and so many of them came. But even that wasn't sufficient on that. And the Virginia model finds its probably strongest um, manifestation in the form of chattel slavery. Uh, that the importation of slaves brought, admitted in very, very large numbers, but clearly with no rights um, and no opportunities for the long term um, in the colony. I argue that the Virginia model stays with us, um, including up into the very present. We saw it in the 19th century with the importation of Chinese contract workers um, in large numbers, but once they finished building the railroad um, in 1882, the Congress passed legislation to exclude them from any further entry into the country and exclude them from citizenship. We saw it again in the Bracero program um, with Mexico during the World War II and then into the 1950s and early 60s um, of admitting large numbers of what we refer to as wetbacks come work hard while our soldiers uh, were fighting, um, but with no membership in the community. And I argue that our tolerance today of undocumented migration is very much a, a manifestation of that Virginia model. Um, that we don't take steps often to curb undocumented migration or to find legal channels for admitting people um, whose work we're looking for. Um, but as an undocumented migrant, um, the workers have very few rights and, again, very few opportunities. Um, and that can be seen even in terms of the debate that's taking place today um, with regard to what's called the DREAM Act as to whether the children who come as very, very young go to school within the United States should have the opportunity to be on a citizenship track. So the Virginia model is, um, is quite alive and well in the United States. But there's a second model that came up with the Massachusetts colony. Um, and the Massachusetts colony was founded, as many of our colonies were, um, on the basis of, a, of religious belief um, as a haven for people who had been persecuted for their religious views um, and were welcome to come and join the colony. Um, and the Puritan uh, leadership of Massachusetts uh, was very, very open again for as the, what became the great migration of families coming to practice their religion, but it was only if the religion was in accordance with the dictates of the colony. Um, and so when there was dissent, when Roger Williams was preaching a different form of religious uh, viewer, Anne Hutchinson, um, a woman, no less, um, was challenging the authority of the ministers, uh, they were excluded and deported from the colony. Um, and it even reached the point where a group of Quakers came, um, repeated their journey um, into Massachusetts, and were executed um, as being an undesirable form of newcomers. Um, that I, Massachusetts model, though, has both a positive and a negative viewpoint. Um, later on, it actually becomes the basis for um, today's refugee policy, where we give priority for admission of refugees uh, when they are in bad situations because of their association with the United States and because they share our democratic values and are persecuted as a result. Um, so it can have a very strong, very positive um, aspect to it. But it has also been the basis for the Alien and Sedition Acts, um, for um, the Red Scares that have taken place, the, and more recently, some of the focus in our anti-terrorism legislation and policies um, that have targeted immigrants and newcomers on the basis of their perceived ideology or perceived religious views. Um, on that. So it, it's had both aspects throughout our history. 
The third model is the Pennsylvania model. Um, it's what we like to think is the, is the nation of immigrants. Um, William Penn provided religious toleration for all groups that wanted to come. He actually advertised on the mainland of the European continent that people should come, they would have freedom, they would have participation in the politics of the new colony of Pennsylvania, um, and welcomed immigrants as presumptive citizens. The idea that they would have a route to naturalize and become part of the society. Um, when we became a nation, that model initially very much um, was at the heart of our understanding of immigration. Um, the Declaration of Independence actually um, elaborates that one of the reasons for separation from England um, was that the British Crown was, and Parliament was trying to restrict immigration um, into the colonies, and the colonies needed immigrants and wanted to have uh, robust immigration. Um, we had a naturalization law passed in 1790 that was again quite expansive um, in welcoming newcomers into our, um, our society and our polity. But as with the other models, there are both positive and negative aspects to this. And I think one can argue that when we have had the strongest backlash about immigrants, it's when we as a country have grave doubts about whether the new immigrants are integrating, adapting to our society, becoming citizens in a way in which we think they should. Um, and so we have the restrictive immigration legislation uh, starting in the 1880s, but eventually taking form in the 1920s of national origins quotas. Um, because people from Britain, Northern Europe were considered to be the good immigrants, people from Eastern and Southern Europe were not considered to be um, assimilatable and therefore were not part of the Pennsylvania model um, in the view of many, many Americans. Um, we always tend to see um, immigrants with rose-colored glasses. Our um, ancestors were the great immigrants. Today's immigrants we're not so sure about. And that has always shaped the way in which we think about immigrants. Um, as early as, as Benjamin Franklin in the 1750s uh, railed against the German immigrants into Pennsylvania, saying that they were never going to learn English um, and that they were going to force everybody in Pennsylvania to learn German. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> this is persistent in our history. So, as a result of these tensions, we've had different forms of immigration and often having quite robust levels of immigration, um, but not necessarily robust welcoming of the immigrants into our midst. Um, and our immigration levels go up and down, so that um, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, um, we were admitting about a million people per year. Um, and immigration was a fairly large part of our, um, of our population. Uh, but perhaps not surprisingly, during the Great Depression, after the uh, national origins um, immigration legislation went into being, um, we had very, very low levels of immigration. Not more than about 500,000 um, people came in over an entire decade. Um, during the Depression, and in actually in one year, in uh, 1932, for the first time in our history, more people left the United States than entered. We had a, a net negative immigration. It never happened before, and it's never happened um, since then. Um, today's immigration is at historic highs, if you look at it in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, whereas in, even in the 1980s, um, immigration was about average a million per year. Um, in the 1990s and into the 2000s, um, the decade totals are estimated to be about 15 million. Um, and yet it's nowhere near the peak as a percentage of the country's population. Um, there are about 38 million, 40 million foreign-born in the United States at present, 
they represent about 13% of the population. Much smaller number in earlier years because of our smaller population base was often in the 20, 25, even 30 uh, percent range. So very high levels, not historically high um, on a proportionate basis. Uh, the resident population, the, the 38 um, or so million, are equally divided um, amongst naturalized citizens, immigrants who have since become US citizens, about 35%. Uh, legal permanent residents, about 30%, people admitted to be on a citizenship track. Um, Two to five percent, nobody's quite sure, temporary workers or people with some type of temporary status. A lot of our students here at Georgetown would fit that category as, as, uh, as temporary residents of the United States. Uh, and then the kicker in terms of the uh, policy debate, about 30 percent of the foreign born are here illegally, are here without authorization. And that, of course, has been the most controversial part of the immigration debate. Uh, in the 1990s and early in, up until 2007, the unauthorized migrant population was the fastest growing component. So not only was it a significant, though still minority percentage, uh, but it was growing much more rapidly than the legal immigrate, immigrant population. Uh, that has changed since 2007. Um, for a variety of reasons, including the economic recession, new enforcement measures, um, actually a growing economy in Mexico, um, net new migration from Mexico, which is our largest source of immigration, is now at zero. Um, that there are about an equal number of people newly coming into the country as those who are either becoming permanent residents here or returning home to Mexico. And so we've seen a real slowdown in the growth of that population. What will happen after the, um, the economic recovery really takes hold um, is, is not very clear. Um, and how sustainable some of the changes are are not clear. But right now, things are relatively stable, at least at the southern border. Interestingly enough, unauthorized migration uh, is the most responsive to market trends. So that although the undocumented numbers went way down as when the recession began, the number of legal immigrants remained at exactly the same level. Uh, and that's largely because it often takes anywhere from five to 40 years before somebody can actually get a, a green card, a visa, to come here legally. And so it doesn't really matter what the economy is if that opportunity finally comes up. And I'll come back to that point because it's a major problem in our, our system. Not so much whether it's market driven or not, but what we're really talking about are families being subject to very, very long separations um, as the process makes itself through um, the, the bureaucracy and the legislative requirements. Um, a couple of things have happened over the last couple of decades that also have um, an effect on immigration and its impact on the United States. Um, historically, immigrants have been highly clustered in a few locations, and usually the gateway cities, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles more recently, um, Houston, Dallas. Um, and very, very high percentages, sometimes as much as 80 or 90 percent of immigrants have been concentrated in five or six states. Um, since the 1990s, though, we've seen those areas continue to get immigrants, but a real dispersal of immigrants across the country. So the fastest growing states for immigration are places like Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, um, and even though the numbers are very small, the rate of increase in places like Alabama, Tennessee, et cetera, are really quite high compared um, in comparative terms to what our, our nation's history has been. Um, what this means is that 
immigration is now a 50 state phenomenon and therefore it's on the political agenda in 50 states which had never been the case before uh, what was acceptable policy for new york california texas florida um, was acceptable policy for the country that's no longer the case um, the other thing that's very significant is the educational background of immigrants today uh, immigrants have both higher levels of education and lower levels of education than the rest of us do. Um, about 25% or so uh, generally tend to have a university degree, even advanced degrees. They come in with very, very high levels of education or they receive it, those education in the United States. But a large segment, um, 40% of the immigrants, have less than a high school education. That means overall immigration is actually, to the US, is pretty much an, an economic plus um, because e immigrants do different things than natives do. They complement the native workforce. They either do the bad jobs that higher educated Americans don't want to do, or they do the very highly educated jobs, high skilled jobs, that Americans may not yet be trained to do. Um, and so there's a symbiotic relationship on an economic basis. Uh, but because of the very large number of immigrants with lower levels of education, and particularly those with less than an eighth grade education, it means their ability to compete in an in a economy that is now an information-based economy um, is very, very difficult for them. Um, and of concern to many of us who are looking at these issues, there, because there's a very high correlation between the educational level of parents and the educational level of children, the worry is that the second generation will, is also finding it much more difficult. Um, to succeed and make it through an educational system that we all know is already pressed very hard um, and has a lot of challenges ahead of it. So those factors, the dispersal of immigrants and the fact that we're talking about um, a very diverse educational background present challenges in terms of formulating what the appropriate sets of policies will be. Um, I, you can probably tell from the way in which I introduced my models, Virginia, Massachusetts, and, and Pennsylvania, that I'm a fan of the Pennsylvania model. Um, that I think that it's when the Pennsylvania model has really taken root and been supported by the American public and by the Congress and by the executive mm -hmm. branch that we have benefited the most from immigration and the immigrants have benefited the most from being here. Um, when we see them as presumptive citizens um, and where they have opportunities to succeed um, in our country. So for me, the major policy challenges today is to figure out ways to restore the Pennsylvania model. Um, and it's under a great deal of pressure because of the dominance um, that we've seen of unauthorized migration, the fact that we have still have about 11 million people without legal status in the country, so therefore out of the confines of the Pennsylvania model, stuck into the Virginia highly exploitable model, rather problematic um, in those terms. Um, and we have a legal immigration system uh, that is highly inefficient, highly bureaucratized, um, and very um, have, finds it very difficult to meet the demands of either our, our economy or of the already resident family members who um, are in, already in the country trying to reunite with their family members abroad. Um, so for me, the challenge that we have ahead, and obviously this is not a great political environment to try to meet such challenges, are that we need to be reducing unauthorized migration into the United States, but doing so in a way that reflects the 
um, commitment to the rights and to the safety and to the well-being of all of the immigrants and our, our own population. Um, I'm the daughter of, of immigrants. Um, I know very much what the experience is to be raised in an immigrant household um, and finding the ability to provide for the security of the of immigrants so that their children can succeed the way I've succeeded or the way Ellen succeeded um, is I think very much paramount. Um, we definitely need to make final policy decisions about what to do with the 11 million who are in the country illegally. It's not an easy policy debate, um, certainly in, in a very highly contentious, um, highly partisan situation. Um, but having an underclass of 11 million people without the ability to exercise their rights um, and in this limbo status, working, paying taxes, but not necessarily reaping any of the benefits, um, really undermines our own system. And I would argue actually makes it harder to put in place the provisions that we need to curb future unauthorized migration. Um, if employers, for example, fear that they're going to lose their workforce um, because they we have new enforcement measures, but no legalization or regularization of the status, they're much less likely to comply, much more likely to go underground, and much harder to actually address the main magnet for undocumented migration, which is work. It's, a, it's the workforce that is the issue. Uh, then we need to be reforming our legal immigration system. Uh, there are three major components of that system. The strongest part of the largest numbers are for family reunification. Um, but we have a few visas for lots of different family relationships. Uh, but if you have um, gotten legal status in the United States, you're from Mexico, your family, you couldn't bring your family with you because you didn't have the money to support everybody all at once. It's very expensive to immigrate into the United States. You may have to wait six, seven years um, in order to legally bring your spouses or your minor children um, into the country. Uh, and you might be able to naturalize in the interim, but if we're talking about people with an eighth grade education, the chances of having rapid naturalization is really quite remote. So we have these long family stays. Meantime, we also have a category for the brothers and sisters of US citizens, mostly immigrants who have naturalized. Um, we're now admitting people who, came 20, who applied 25 years ago. Um, if you apply today, you might be eligible in 40 or 50 years to come in, because we only have 65,000 visas available. Um, I can say this given my age, but um, we're doing something which is absolutely ludicrous. The, uh, median age of the principal applicants coming in in that category um, are between 55 and 60. So we're admitting them when they're close to retirement, keeping them out when they're of working age. Um, and so we have a lot of things in our family category. They're neither humane nor particularly smart um, in terms of how to design an immigration policy. Uh, we also have a, a, a work permit system that is very, very dysfunctional. Um, we do have a, a lot of visas for people with higher levels of education, that 25% that's better educated than, than many of us are. Um, but if you're from India or China, and you have a master's or a, or a doctorate, um, and you're you know, Microsoft or Amazon or whatever company wants to sponsor you for admission as a permanent resident. Um, the wait is now about six years. Clearly, that makes no sense either. If you're a low-skilled worker, but you're also in an essential industry, you know, you're doing work that nobody else wants to do, there are now 10,000 visas per year for all workers without a bachelor's degree. Again, very few. People come in through temporary work programs. In some cases, they're able to become permanent residents, uh, but 
there's no easy mechanism for adjusting their status. Uh, we also have problems, our third area is a humanitarian program, that's where we resettle refugees and bring people in who um, are subject to, um, to persecution, violence, human rights abuses in their home country. Uh, many of those have worked for the U.S. government, um, and that's exactly why they're in that, um, that situation. Uh, I was in Amman in January, uh, met with many of the Iraqis who had worked for the U.S. government who are, are awaiting resettlement, uh, but they have to go now through security checks in five separate agencies, even if they had worked for the U.S. military um, as a translator and interpreter um, in Iraq. Um, they, and by the time, it's all in sequence, so by the time that the fifth agency has approved it, the approval from the first agency has expired. So I interview people who have been waiting for three, four years in order to be resettled. And again, these are people who are under harm because of their association with us. It makes little sense. Even worse, there's a provision that if you provided some material support to an insurgency, um, you're not admissible into the United States, even if it was coerced. And so we have cases of women who were raped and held in captivity by insurgent groups who were then denied entry into the US because they provided material support. They cooked or gave sex to the, um, to the insurgents. Lots of things that's an overreaction to a serious problem of terrorism, but uh, taking it out on people who are actually the victims of terrorism, not the, uh, the perpetrators of it. So we need to do a lot more to make our legal immigration system rational, serve our interests, and serve the interests of the US as a world power. Um, and that's a lot of what we do as a in terms of our refugee policy is in that category. Uh, fourth area where we need to do much more is in terms of the integration of immigrants. Uh, we need a more robust public-private partnership between business that benefits from immigrants, public school systems, government, uh, local government programs of all sorts for housing, for food security, etc., cetera, um, and with the federal government. Uh, the federal government makes decisions on who's admitted, on whether people will be deported. Um, it needs to play a stronger role in helping communities with the resources that are needed uh, to help with that integration process, particularly focusing on the second generation uh, to make sure that they're able to benefit. And then a fourth challenge is how do we manage all of this? Um, the immigration agencies in the federal government have historically been extremely weak, um, and they continue to be so, even though they're now in the Department of Homeland Security, but not necessarily the parts of that agency um, that really have the resources and the ability to carry out their functions. Now, I've laid out, obviously, a, a huge, huge um, set of issues, and so the obvious question that you must be asking is how reasonable is any of this? Is this a ivory tower academic giving her views on what should happen? Um, and frankly, the prospects for reforms of this sort are not particularly good right now. Um, but the history of American immigration is that immigration reform is never easy. Um, we didn't have any immigration policies of any real meaning until the 1870s. Um, then we had a series of reforms over a number of years. First, real quantitative restriction on immigration, putting a number in terms of how many immigrants should come in was not until 1921. The national origins quotas put in place in 1924 weren't abolished until the civil rights movement. In, legislation in 1965. Uh, they went on as highly discriminatory policies throughout that period. Um, and for people trying to escape Nazi Germany and uh, the areas that um, it controlled with very, very tragic ramifications um, in terms of an inability to enter the country as refugees. Um, 
And we had another change in legal immigration in 1990. So these things don't happen overnight. Um, and, but what's important is to begin the process of working on it. And one of the interesting things about immigration um, is that it's always attracted strange bedfellows. Um, it's always, up until very, very recently, uh, been a bipartisan issue. Um, where you have free market Republicans, libertarians who are very pro-immigration, of course churches, labor unions uh, being at least pro the immigrants that they want to unionize, not necessarily all immigrants, um, but you do have a right-left coalition that can come together. Unfortunately, they mostly come together to stop things. Um, and there hasn't been a very concerted effort to really think about what are the core issues that a right-left coalition can come together to support. Um, we thought the DREAM Act was one of them. Um, it had high levels of bipartisan support, um, perhaps with a, a Republican bill having just been um, introduced, some negotiations will take place. I'm in support of incremental change. Um, even though I know where I'd like to go in the future, I think we can be taking a lot of interim steps in order to be able to get them. Get there things like the DREAM Act, which will be helpful for the children who came here illegally, um, although not a panacea, certainly for either the children or their parents. Um, so lots to be done, certainly a key issue of social justice. Um, and is one where we're not just thinking about how many immigrants come into the country at any given time, but we're really thinking about how do we make them part of us, uh, part of the broader society, part of our polity, um, and ensure that their rights are respected. Um, it's an essential matter of social justice and one that I would hope will get the attention of more Americans whose own forefathers came as a result of the of immigration, because we indeed are a nation of immigrants. Thank you. Dr. Martin will take questions. I've got about 14 <laughs> in my head, but I'm sure some of you have questions as well. Could, could you discuss how other countries handle immigration? I spent a lot of time in Canada. And they seem to have a very different approach than we do. And I, I think at one time, was, if you had money, if you had $100,000, they would grant you citizenship. And I don't know whether they'd change that. Could we do the same thing, or we, is that? We actually do the same thing. We, do the same thing? <laughs> we, have, we have a category also. Um, it's an employment base five, EB5 um, category, where if you're an investor, willing to invest money in the United States, you can get a green card. Turns out we very few people take us up on it. Um, and the reason is that this is another complication. It has nothing to do with immigration uh, policy, and it has nothing to do with their interest in being here. Um, it turns out that the real issue is tax policy. Um, because there's another category that's called a treaty investor. Um, that's a, it, you can be renewed year after year after year. If you have that, you, the only money that's income that's taxed is what you earn in the United States. If you become a permanent resident of the United States, your worldwide income is taxed. Um, and so part of the challenge of trying to reform immigration is to think about all of these collateral areas that have have an impact. Um, but your larger question about um, other countries, um, nobody is doing immigration well enough to really be proud of their immigration system. I would say the Canadians come the closest. Um, they have a point system in which they um, admit people as a, on the basis of their human capital and their skills. Um, they also now, though, have been having a growing policy for admitting based on employer demands. And um, it turns out that people who do really, really well on a point system, who you know, ace it in terms of their educational level, in terms of their language, you know, that they speak English or French, uh, are younger, et cetera, um, aren't necessarily employable, because they may not be the people that the employers want to hire, even if they look good on paper. <laughs> 
Um, and so every country is struggling. How do you figure out what your shortages are? How do you design a policy that allows you to fill those shortages? What's the level of relationship that you want for family reunification? Uh, do you want to go out to what's called chain migration of lots of different levels, you know, rem removal from the core? Um, how do you handle your refugee policy with regard to people who come in? What do we do when there's an earthquake in Haiti? Do we offer temporary protected status, which we eventually did, it took a while, we had not been through four hurricanes that were extremely disruptive. Um, but there are a lot of reasons to be hesitant about that policy because um, people who got uh, Hondurans and Nicaraguans who received temporary protected status as a result of Hurricane Mitch in 1998 still have temporary status. And we've renewed it every single year or every other year um, because the, their countries say they can't absorb them back, they can't lose the remittances uh, that they're sending. Um, and we have no provision to adjust them to permanent status. Um, I'll tell you the stupidest thing about temporary protected status. Um, it was put in place for the volcano in Montserrat, in the Caribbean. Um, and it was renewed about five times. Um, and then the National Oceanic and Administrative NOAA um, came out with a definitive report that said that no one would ever be able to go back to uh, Montserrat because of the level of damage and the fact that the volcano was continuing um, and that it was not in anyone's lifetime that return was possible. Um, and so the U.S. government lifted temporary protection from all of the people because it was no longer temporary, didn't fit the law anymore. We had no alternative for them. There's no permanent slot that they could fill. So they're kind of in limbo. Some have gone to the UK. Um, others have found other ways of staying here legally. Um, others are still in limbo. So we, you know, and we're not the only ones. Um, when the Libyan crisis erupted and there were boats going, you probably remember the, the stories of the boats going across the Atlantic, um, the European Union has a temporary protection policy as well. It was supposed to be you know, it was designed for exactly that kind of situation. You could never come to agreement on whether to trigger it or not. Um, the Italian government finally said people can land in, um, in you know, Sicily, they can get off the boats, um, and we'll give them th you know, three days to show up at an immigration station and apply for, for status. And by the way, there's the train station and there's France. They speak French there, you speak French, why don't you go there? Um, so very few countries do it well um, on that, which in, in the, I'm being really long-winded in my response, but it, that opened up so many things. I would say that in terms of immigrant integration, we probably do it better than anyone else does. Um, and it's, we don't have, unlike almost every other country like that has robust immigration, Canada or Australia or in the UK or um, even Germany. Um, now, we don't have an immigrant integration policy. They all do. Um, but what we have is birthright citizenship. It means you're only a foreigner for one generation. Your children are automatically US citizens. They may face problems for other reasons, but not because they're immigrants. You can't be it past one generation. Um, we have, because of our history of slavery, um, we have very strong anti-discrimination laws, and they apply to immigrants as well, if they're going to be discriminated against on the basis of race, religion, nationality, et cetera, they kick in. Um, we have very flexible labor market. If you want to work hard, you, know, you can usually get a job. Um, and if you, there were demonstrations a number of years ago against some of the um, very anti-immigrant legislation that had been proposed. And there were you know, people out there who were undocumented um, holding up signs that say, we work, we pay taxes, we deserve um, you know, understanding. And so that flexibility in our labor market, you know, these are the things that really help 
immigrants integrate, and the fact that you know, we are a country of immigration, and so we know it, we're comfortable with it, sometimes. My forebears came to this country, I guess, under the Pennsylvania model. They may not have known it at the time, but that's probably the way it worked. And they were supported by an organization called the Jewish Agricultural Society, which permitted them to establish a small farm and make a few dimes. My father escaped the farm and went to Rutgers, actually. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are we doing? I, I think a lot of resentment to the current crop of immigrants comes from the fact they haven't integrated and they haven't found a way up in the American economy. And what are we doing and what could we do to throw a life raft to these people to make it possible for the second generation to, to yeah. advance? Well, I think a, a lot of the focus has to be on the public school systems. Um, that And again, it, it's really hard because they're floundering for lots of other reasons, as well as the inability to um, absorb these this new population. Um, I I remember when my um, I was going to elementary school and my grandmother, um, who at that time her English was not very good, uh, would be coming into the school when I was going out because all of the public schools in that area in New Jersey um, were open in the late afternoon and early evening for class, English classes and civics classes for the immigrants. It was just assumed it happened all over the country. Um, when I was directing the Immigration Commission, um, I had a consultation with public school officials with regard, could we do something of that sort? Um, and they all said, well, the insurance it would be prohibitive of keeping, the, you know, we, the security screening of who comes into the into the building, um, you know, the janitorial services of keeping them open late at night. And, you know, all of these were perceived as barriers that prevented that type of situation. And some of the research that we did indicated that really that didn't mo didn't matter all that much what model of English language instruction a school system adopted, whether it was intensive English or bilingual education or um, or fully bilingual, you know, two language um, training or sink or swim or whatever. Uh, the, what affected how well the children did was were their parents involved? Was there really good interaction between the teachers and the students? Um, were the teachers well trained in whatever that model was? And it turns out that about 50% of those who were teaching English in Again, all of these models um, had never had any training whatsoever in doing so. Um, and often there were no systems in place to provide them support, whatever. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that where if we try to do more for the parents, not only are we helping them, we're also helping their children to stay in school and to do, um, to do much better um, on it. Um, I think that it's something of a, I mean, much as I'm worried about particularly the immigrants with very low levels of education, um, a lot of the statistics still are quite promising um, in terms of the second generation. Um, historically, our big problem has never been getting the second generation to learn English. It's having the second generation and third generation plus learning any foreign language. Fortunately, we're still in that situation. Um, the immigrants are learning English, and certainly the second generation is becoming monolingual English speakers um, at a very, very high rate. Um, so some of the complaints that uh, we've received in places like Miami uh, from businesses that were trying to build the business with Latin America was that with all of the Cuban, Nicaraguan, um, other population um, in Miami, they couldn't find workers who were literate in Spanish. Uh, they spoke street Spanish, but they had never been educated in Spanish. And so all of those jobs went unfilled, or they had to recruit people from outside. Uh, so, there, so I'm actually still pretty optimistic that the, the second generation is going to do well, but I do worry that we're not putting in place the measures, particularly in terms of education. And listening to your answer, keeping in mind Ellen's ideals, we certainly shouldn't ignore the 
legal population that has similar needs exactly. for service to what you're describing. Yeah. Right. And, um, and obviously, no policies that only focus on immigrants of whatever stripe and don't look at the fact that they're often living in communities where there are a lot of poor people with low levels of education that are facing exactly the same problems. So it's, it can't be done as you know, immigrant policy. It has to be done as education policy, and it has to be. But taking into account that immigrant kids have special needs, special challenges that other kids might not have. On that, but it, it's, a, it's a societal issue, uh, not just an immigration issue. When, when our parents or grandparents emigrated, they emigrated, to the, emigrated, emigrated to the United States, 19th century through the 1920s, it was a one way trip. Was that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought there was. I thought the time. Depends on where. Okay. Because I, my sense was that that has changed recently. Okay. But much more now, the immigrants uh, maintain a relationship with the country they have, they have left. Right. And there's a constant back and forth, which I think is ad, it, it, it both adds and creates problems. Um, Italian immigrants were called birds of passage. And there was a reason for it, about 60% of the Italians who came here went back and then many of them circulated. Um, it was even higher for Greeks, a um, number of other groups. Um, you know, if you're coming, if you were a Jew coming out of Tsarist Russia, you stayed and you probably came as a family. If you were coming from Italy, you probably came as a young man. And then only after the war happened and they started settling did they start bringing their uh, spouses and, and children to reunite with them. Um, so we've always had the issue of a lot of circular migration. Uh, but what, you know, clearly it was a lot harder then to keep that cycle going. Today it's you know, very, very easy. We have cheap airline, uh, you know, airfares. We have um, the internet. We have cell phones. We have lots of ways in which people can stay um, together. Um, a big focus of policy now is how to link um, migration policy and development policy together so that people in developing countries ha have opportunities to stay home when that's what they want, what that's what's appropriate, be able to find economic opportunities there, um, but when they want to migrate or when they have the opportunity to migrate, um, to have them be able to um, contribute back to their home communities um, in, a, in a more systematic way. Um, and there are pluses and negatives, you're absolutely right, of that connection. Um, on the one hand, people you know, do maintain the um, the trade, the communications, the travel, etc., with their home communities, and, and that can be uh, very satisfying and and, um, and help them cope with the uh, being in a new location. Um, there are concerns, though, about when immigrants send billions of dollars back to their home countries, which is true in many cases. Um, what are they not investing in here? Um, are kids being pulled out of school earlier than they should be in order to go to work because there's another family back home that needs to be supported. Um, so these are complex issues, um, and, but I think it's in the nature of, of our today's globalization. I don't think that there's any way of saying to people who are migrating, you have to choose this country or that country, um, it's, it, it's, that's a Sophie's choice that they you know, really should not be expected to do. Well, I think it's enriching to both, it's just different. Yeah, and there's something now called social remittances. There are studies being done in villages in the Dominican Republic um, in which d um, women from the DR who come to live in Boston or into New York um, and return home and they say to their sisters and to their mothers saying, yeah, he should be helping you. <laughs> 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 
this and I don't want a television set, I want a refrigerator so I don't have to go to the market every day. And that'll free up some labor, you know, who are taking a different view about what is acceptable living and who say, no, it's not acceptable to beat me. You know, if, if, you know, if my brother-in-law did that to my sister, he'd be arrested. You know, so that type of exchange can be you know, really quite powerful. <laughs> yeah, how do we know something that's supposed okay it's how do we know there are 11 million people here illegally <laughs> on that I had my first job in Washington I I'd come in to be the research director um, of another federal commission um, that was headed up by uh, father Hesburgh uh, and the first assignment I got was what number should the commission use so we commissioned um, the Census Bureau and the Immigration Service to work together, trying to come up with a methodology. And it turns out that our labor force surveys and our census actually counts a lot of people who are here illegally. And we've done a lot of smaller surveys to figure out the undercount. Whom have we missed? You know, so you go out to a neighborhood and you work with the community organization to find out who actually submitted the census um, documents and who didn't, and then you can figure out the homeless, undocumented migrants, um, college students, you know, there are all sorts of people who are undercounted uh, because of the nature of what they do. Um, so we have a fairly good idea of how many foreign nationals are counted in the, in the census. Um, and we have a pretty good idea of what, who is not counted in it. We know everybody who was admitted legally, one form or another. We have, ver we have good statistics on who's died. We have good statistics on who's been born, but they're citizens, they're born here. We have lousy citizen statistics on who's left the country. And so that's the weak part of the estimate. Um, in terms of figuring it out, but it's basically the census number adjusted for the undercount minus those who came legally, minus those who died, minus those who left, the estimate of that. Those who remain are the 11 million, and that's how we know. Um, this has been tested through all sorts of different ways. Um, one of the things when we were uh, trying to decide whether to use this number, um, as a test case, I, uh, we had some information on border crossings of what um, states people came from in Mexico. And so I asked them at different estimates, because people were at 20 million, others were at 2 million, 4 million, 5 million. So I asked different estimates, what's the implication for the population in Mexico? Um, and so we started working with the Mexican census, and under some of the, um, the really high numbers, uh, there would have been negative population in Mexico. Nobody would be living in those states in Mexico. <laughs> um, and so we threw those out. So you tested in those ways. Um, do you know, they show people leaving when we're showing people arriving, and you reconcile it. <coughs> We have time for one more question. I think it used to be true some years ago we used to hear that if an immigrant married an American, the class led to a green card yes. and citizenship. Is that still true? Well, there are no numerical limits on the spouses of U.S. citizens. Um, so in that sense, there are no, none of these 20-year waits. Um, for doing it. Um, plus, you can naturalize in three years once you get your green card. If you're the spouse of a U.S. citizen, it's five years for everyone else. So it is a fast track, and it's considered to be a, you know, something that um, is beneficial for the family and for the society. Um, I actually am very supportive of, of having a, a robust family reunification policy um, because when I was talking about what what is it that helps in terms of integrating immigrants well 
most of the integration takes place in the family and the community that that family is part of. Um, and so admitting people with no connections to the country um, is actually probably going to make it even more difficult for them to integrate um, when, but admitting them into the context where the family has to have an affidavit of support saying that they will financially support the individual um, and you know, really be tested in terms of the legitimacy of the relationship. Um, that spouse of a U.S. citizen, um, if it's a new marriage, will get a conditional green card for two years and then will have to convince an immigration officer at the end of two years that it was a real marriage. If any of you have been watching House <laughs> you'll know this process um, that he's been going through with his wife. <laughs> well, I think this has been an extraordinary lecture, a conversation, and great sets of questions back. I'd like you to join me in thanking Susan Martin for this amazing <laughs>